we got a child between the age of three years old and the third grade, and you'd like to go to Children's Church, we welcome you to go, and uh, we're thankful for the opportunity to share in the Word of God today, and uh, uh, we're thankful for Brother Blair and sharing in the Word while we were gone. We went on a trip to Arizona, um, drove about 30 hours one way, and pulled a cargo trailer and brought Austin and Val home, and uh, we're just excited about what God's going to be doing in their hearts and their lives, and uh, moving forward, and you'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks, but we just welcome them back to Jacob's Well this morning and ask God to just uh, continue to have his will in his way. If you've got a Bible this morning, you want to read along with me, I'm going to be in Romans chapter 8, amen, that's where I'll be this morning. We, we start our, uh, our uh, summer series, I, I'm excited about this because uh, I've never done a summer series, amen, I don't know if I've ever done a series at all, bless the Lord, but uh, 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 God just laid this on my heart back in uh, December, and uh, uh, it's about coffee cups and t-shirts, and, uh, and it's a really uh, simple, simple sermon series uh, because it always consists of only one verse. Uh, we're just going to read one verse today, and uh, by the uh, grace of God and by the unction of the Holy Spirit, we're going to unpack that one verse. But this is one verse that is uh, uh, probably most profound, one of the most profound verses that there is in the Word of God. Um, probably outside of John 3.16, it's probably one of the most... Uh, well-known verses um, if, if you probably didn't have a Bible today and you didn't even open it up to Romans chapter 8 you could probably quote this verse I'm sure that many of you already know it by heart because it's a verse that testifies to us in the life that we live and the life that we face in day in and day out uh, if anybody ever walked through uh, troubled waters amen anybody ever been in a place in life where you uh, had more questions than you did answers amen uh, has anybody ever been through a place and you can look at the last two years uh, of, of the world that we've lived in and the life that we've known and seen uh, that there's a lot of things uh, that we just don't understand a lot of things that are uncertain a lot of things that are unknown uh, and uh, we look at the complexities of life uh, and, and realize that uh, it can be overwhelming at times uh, that, and we look at, uh, we look at the world in, a, in itself and, and, and wonder how uh, that we're ever going to make it. We wonder how our children and our grandchildren uh, and what's going to happen in generations to come uh, because we see so much evil and we see so much destruction uh, and we see so much corruption. Uh, our, our government is corrupt. Uh, our leaders are corrupt. Uh, and, and we see so much moral corruption and moral failure, even at the highest of levels. Uh, and nobody wants to take responsibility for their actions. Uh, and people will turn ahead and They'll, and they'll turn a, a blind eye to what's going on. It, and, and it just troubles me in my spirit today. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I know there's a place where I can find peace and I can find hope uh, and I can rest. Uh, and that's in the Word of God. Because the Bible said in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor uh, and are heavy laden, and I will uh, give you rest. Uh, and that rest today as we come to the Word of God. Uh, because Jesus said, the Bible said in John 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. Uh, and dwelt among us. So we come to the Word of God. We look to Jesus today to see what Jesus has to say uh, about the complexities, the trials, uh, the troubles, and the tragedies uh, that we find uh, in this life. Romans chapter 8, read with me if you will, verse 28. Uh, and the Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called uh, according uh, to his purpose. Let's read it one more time, okay? Just for good measure, because I want you to get it, amen? Uh, the Bible said, and we know that all things uh, work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called uh, according uh, to his purpose. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for the day, God. We thank you for how you work uh, and move and have your being for the God. Father, we thank you that your hand's not cut off, your arm's not made short for the God. You are not slack concerning your promises, God, uh, that what you have promised you will perform, God. Uh, I thank you today for the God, for the word of God that encourages us and builds us up and strengthens us uh, and lifts us up in an hour and a time uh, such as this. God, I pray, God, that you just move in this place today for the God, uh, but I pray the Holy Ghost of oh God will take this word. Lord, I pray you will search our hearts with it for the God. If there's a place of uncertainty, a place of, of, of unknowing God, a place for the God that we know not, I pray in the name of Jesus today for the God that you just speak that peace. Lord, you give that hope, God, that encouragement today for the God. We fill us from the word of God. But I pray the spirit and the word would work together today and I pray that you'd accomplish much in the house of the Lord. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
and amen and amen. Everybody, please be seated. Uh, 25 words, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. 25 uh, words, that's all it is. Uh, but it's some of the most simple words. Uh, if you really get to looking at the grammar uh, of this one verse, uh, it's really about a first or second grade uh, reading level. Uh, it's that C uh, spot uh, run. But these are 25 uh, profound words, powerful words, uh, words that speak to us uh, concerning troubled times uh, that you and I walk through uh, in this life. Uh, when things just not going our way, uh, when things are not going like we thought uh, or planned, uh, we oftentimes will quote uh, Romans 8.28. Uh, when it goes from bad to worse, uh, you need to know Romans uh, 8.28. Uh, when it ain't worked out uh, like you thought it would work out, uh, then you need to know uh, Romans 8 uh, and 28. Uh, because Romans 8 and 28 will just swell up on the inside of you. Uh, and it'll begin to help you. Uh, because this is what the Word uh, of God is able to do. Uh, there's power uh, in the Word of God. Uh, power uh, to see God demonstrate uh, his, magnif his magnitude of His grace uh, and His mercy uh, and His love uh, in our life. Paul starts this word out uh, in verse 28. Uh, and he says, uh, and uh, we know. And uh, we know. He said, we don't wish, we don't think, we don't hope. He says, we don't even believe. He said, we know. We know. Listen to me, sometimes it's who you know, but when it comes to the Word of God, it's what you know. And we live in a world today, my friend, where they want you to turn off your mind uh, and go by your feelings. Uh, and they're not concerned uh, about what you know uh, because they want you to operate in such a way uh, that you allow your emotions uh, to govern your decisions uh, and motivate you and try to move you uh, in this life. Uh, but you need to know uh, today uh, what the Word of God says. Not only do you need to know it, but you need to acknowledge where your help comes from. Amen. You need to acknowledge that you didn't get here by yourself. You need to acknowledge uh, that your degree didn't make a way for you. Uh, your money ain't made a way for you. Uh, your hard work uh, ain't paved uh, the road uh, to your success. Uh, you need to acknowledge today uh, that if it had not been for the Lord uh, who was on my side, uh, if it had not been for God uh, who made a way uh, out of no way, uh, if it had not been for the Lord uh, who healed, uh, delivered, uh, set free, uh, and made whole, uh, I never uh, would would have made it huh, without Jesus. See, there's some things huh, that we need to know. We can know that God expects us huh, to know. And Paul's being dogmatic here. Five times in the book of Romans, he says, huh, and we know. Because he said there's some things huh, that a believer huh, just ought to know. There's some things that you and I ought to stand on. There's some truth that you and I need to rest on. And he says, and we know. Now, who in the world is we? Because if you realize what Paul's saying in this verse, that there is some exclusivity to this, to this verse. This verse ain't for everybody. Okay? He said, and we know. We know. Well, Paul answers this question uh, at the beginning of the verse, at the end uh, of the verse. Because he says, we uh, are them that love God uh, and are the called uh, according uh, to his purpose. That's who we are. That's who the we are. Because he says, first of all, uh, it's them that love God. Now, when he says it's them that love God, this word love uh, in the Greek uh, means morally and socially. That's what it means in the Greek. You can look it up. It means to love much. You remember what, you remember what Jesus said uh, in Luke's Gospel chapter 7 uh, when he was in Simon the Pharisee's house uh, and there was this woman of the city uh, who came in with an alabaster box uh, of ointment uh, and got down at Jesus' feet uh, and wiped his feet, washed them with her tears, uh, wiped his feet with her hair, his, her head, uh, broke that box, oh, box open, uh, poured that ointment out uh, upon his feet. Uh, the fragrance filled the room uh, and Simon the Pharisee said in his heart, uh, if he were a prophet, he would know that this woman is a sinner. She's a woman of the city, and he would know who it is that touches him. And Jesus said, 
Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. Jesus spoke up. He said, Simon, tell me this. He said, if a, if a creditor had two debtors, and one owed him 500 pence, and one owed him 50 pence, and yet neither one of them could pay, and he forgave the debt of both of them, who's going to love him more? And Simon said to one who forgave him the most, and Jesus said, Thou hast rightly said. He said, from the time that I came into your house, he said, I came in and you gave me no water to wash my feet. He said, from the time I entered your house, he said, you greeted me with no kiss. He said, you gave me no oil. He said, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet. She has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. And she has anointed my feet with this perfume. With this alabaster box, I tell you this is what Jesus said to Simon. He that has been forgiven little loves little. But he who has been forgiven much loves much. And what I need you to understand is that when the Bible says, Paul said in Romans 8, 28, that they who love God, our love is rooted and defined by our understanding of the forgiveness of God that we have received. Do you understand where your love lies, where your love bubbles up from, where your love is rooted in? It's rooted in the forgiveness of God that has met us as sinners undeserving of God's grace. That's where our love for God comes from. That love for God, because when you know the cost that was paid, when the sacrifice that was made, and the life that was given, it'll cause you to love Jesus like you ain't never loved Jesus before in your life. And Paul said the we are them who love God. Love God. And are the called according to his purpose. He said the called. Anytime that the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans speaks of the called, he's talking about those who have come to faith and believe in the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and have made them, made him their Lord and their Savior. That's who Paul's talking about. He's talking about the saved and the born again. Paul ain't talking about just those who say, I believe in God. Because anybody can believe in God. He's talking about those who belong to God. There's a difference in believing in God and belonging to God. There's a lot of people who say they believe that there is a God, but that doesn't mean that they are the sons or the daughters of God. When we look in this passage of Scripture, we have to understand who Paul's talking to because this promise is exclusive to us as born-again believers who love God, who love God. There should never be a place in your life or my life where the love of God comes into question. Never. Never. Listen to what he said. I know we went from the beginning to the end, but we had to. Just so that we could get to the middle. He said, and we know. I can't get out of we know. He said, and we know. That word know in the Greek means Ido, E I D O. You know what that means? That means uh, that I have seen, to behold, to be aware of. You say, preacher, what's that mean? He says, and we know, Ido knowledge uh, is knowledge that we have gained uh, because we've seen it. We've seen it. I know rain falls from the sky. Why? Because I've seen it fall from the sky. 
I know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Why? Because I've seen the sun rise in the east and I've seen the sun set in the west. I know it because I've seen it. It speaks of past tense. Why? Because he wants us to know that what he's saying when he says, and we know he's not speaking just about the future promise of tomorrow. He's talking about the testimony of yesterday. And he said the reason we can say and we know is because I've seen God do it already. And sometimes uh, when you face uncertainties uh, and you don't know uh, and you have questions uh, about the future uh, and tomorrow uh, and you're complex uh, and, you're, and you're in a place of ang- anxiousness uh, and worry uh, and doubtful uh, and afraid, uh, then bless God, uh, you need to remember uh, what God uh, has already showed you. Because God has already allowed us to see some things. Amen. Because I know God will make a way out of no way. I've seen him make a way out of no way. I've seen him heal. I've seen him deliver. I've seen him break bondages. I've seen him bring the prodigal home. I've seen him reconcile. I've seen him restore. I've seen him heal bodies of cancer. I've seen what God is able to do. And because I've seen him, they ought to be something that rises up on the inside of me and says, I know, I know, and it ought to testify to what I believe that God is able to do. It ought to point me forward. It ought to push me into that next place that God has prepared for me because I know. He said, and we know, and we know. I just, I just really want to make sure you know, amen, <laughs> because I, gotta, I, I, I don't want you to come, come down. Well, I'm not sure, brother. I don't want you looking at your circumstance, shaking your head, throwing up your hands, turning your back and saying, it's too much for me. God never brought you to something that was too much uh, for you and him uh, together. Amen. The dependency is not on you. The dependency is on God to get it done. If God promised it, he will perform it. He don't expect you to try to do it on your own. Get there by yourself. Know and have knowledge of everything that needs to be done. God will do it. Amen. Got to do it. He said, and we know... Now, if you look in other translations beside the King James, uh, you'll find out uh, that they put God right after, and we know. They say, and we know God works all things together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. But the King James doesn't put God right there. And it's not that the King James is wrong. I think Paul just wants us to understand as those who wrote this translation that we already ought to know it was God. (laughs) We ought not to. Ain't nobody going to have to tell us that was God. We ought to be in a place in our life as a people of faith, as a people who believe, as a people who love God and are operating and are called according to his purpose. Ain't nobody got to tell me that was God. I know when it was God. Amen. You ought to know it's God. You ought to know it's God. It was God in the beginning, and it's God in the end. And just because uh, the King James doesn't have God, and we know God, and too many times in our life, uh, if we don't see the word God, uh, we think he's absent because he's silent. We think because he's silent uh, that he's absent uh, and he must not know what's going on and he he done gone and left. uh, But I need to tell somebody this morning that God uh, never leaves us uh, and he never forsakes us, uh, that he's always there uh, beginning to end uh, and every point uh, in the middle, uh, God uh, is ever present. Amen. He's ever present. He's always there. He never leaves. 
He never abandoned. Somebody might have told you uh, that they'd never leave you and they'd never forsake you, but they turned up and walked away uh, and walked out of your life, uh, abandoned you. Uh, but that's not God. That's not God. God is ever-present. He is the omnipotent God. He's the omniscient God. He's the omnipresent God. He said, and we know that all things work together for good. That all things, all things. Now, we like to think that God can work through some things. And maybe, maybe even most things. And maybe many things. But very few of us, if we really answer this question, if we really answer, Paul said all things. You know what that means? A-L-L, -L, all, all, everything. There ain't nothing that God can't work together. There ain't nothing that God can't work through. Brother, you're a testimony back there that God can do anything. Amen. There's some testimonies in this house this morning already. Time's past, and we ought to be celebrating because we know what God is able to do. He said, and we know that all things work together. They work together for good. Now, that word good means agathos in the Greek. Agathos, good. You say, well, well, preacher, my good and God's good ain't the same. And you're right. Your definition of what's good and God's definition of what's good ain't the same. Because agathos means to benefit. It means beneficial. It means to strengthen, to build up, to mature. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, Agathos, I put away childish things. God is able to bring us to a place of maturity in him because here's the deal, people. If you read down in verse 29, God wants us to understand he's not there just to make us comfortable. He's there to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And sometimes you got to walk through some mess uh, to get there. You got to go through some stuff. Uh, look at what Jesus had to go through, and you think you ain't got to go through nothing? God ain't there just to make you happy and healthy and give you blessing and success and prosper you along the way and give you a, a money in the bank and a great job uh, with meaningful purpose uh, and give you a big house and nice clothes uh, and give you material things. Uh, that ain't God's uh, desire uh, for your life uh, as much as God uh, wants you to be uh, like his son, uh, Jesus Christ. Look at here. There is what is good to me, and there is what is good for me. Mint chocolate chip ice cream, it's good to me. I can sit down and eat a whole gallon at one time. Oh, I love that mess. That mess is so good. It's good to me, but it ain't good for me. That rice and that brown gravy, oh, that's good to me. But that broccoli, that's good for me. Yeah. That, 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 that fried pork chop, oh, hallelujah, that's good to me. But, but that, that broiled fish, that, that's good for me. Yeah. That, that, um, that, that them mashed potatoes, and they smothered in that gravy. He just mix it all up. And they, you can't tell the brown from the white. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. It's so good. It's good to me. But that asparagus, that, that, that's good for me. And what we go through life desiring huh, is the things that are good to me. 
We want God to give us the things that are good to me. But God says, no, I got to work things together for good. And the good that I'm looking to bring out of your life is not what is good to you, but it's what is good for you. And if you're going to go through it, then you just got to go through it. Amen. You know what? God is a good teacher. We say he's a good, good father, and he is, but he's also a good, good teacher. You know, because God will oftentimes put you to the test, and he will try you in your faith, and if you just so happen to fail this test, you know what God will do. God will review the material again. He'll bring it back up in your life. He'll allow you some more study time, and you get to take the test all over again. Now, that's a good, good teacher. Because you know what his, his desire is? That you pass and not fail. And you say, why in the world, God, am I going through this again and again and again? Look at your neighbor and tell him it's a test. It's a test. But for some reason or another, we don't get it. <laughs> for some reason or another, we get an F and not an A. For some reason or another, we might even climbed up to a D, but we still ain't got a C yet. So God said, I'm not satisfied with what you think you know because you really don't know what I want you to know. And when you know what I want you to know, then you'll know me like I want you to know me. And we know. The problem is we think we know enough. And we don't need to know no more. We satisfied at the level we at. So we just going to rock this thing on out, wait for Jesus to come and catch us away in the glory and go to heaven and be with him one day. But the more we know is what enables us uh, to walk in the purpose uh, and the plan that God has for our life. Listen to me, God has already invested uh, too much in your life uh, for you to go out and do what you want to do the way you want to do it and live the life you want to live uh, and go to heaven with him one day uh, and not uh, have walked in uh, the purpose uh, that God has uh, for your life. God's made an investment in you. Think about what God has done just so you could walk in the purpose that he has for you. He said, and we know that all things work together. <laughs> Y'all say, this is one verse. This is one verse. One verse. Yes, it is one verse. But when you study this one verse, then you can really understand what God wants you to know. He said, and we work all things together. That word work means... Uh, I can't, say, I can't say this word in the Greek. It starts with an S, U, R, sort of genus or something like that. It's the way we get the American word synergy from. It's where you take uh, two elements that are different from each other, at least two elements, you put them together, and you make something new. Okay? And, and that's, that's what he's talking about here, how he works things together. And you, you said, I thought God would have worked this out a long time ago. He said, I've been praying about this a long time. Let me help you. Because we went to Arizona 30 hours, 30 hours one way, 30 hours one way. Did I say it was 30 hours one way? Did I say we was pulling a cargo trailer? Did I say that the first 10 miles into the journey, we already had to take a detour? <laughs> Blows my mind. I preached about detours before I left. I remember saying something to our seniors about detours. We ain't got 10 miles in the journey. We got to take a detour around because the bridge is out going to Thomasville. So here we are taking a detour. And I'm telling you, it was one detour after another detour where there was no signs and where there was signs. Because <laughs> we went on a long detour. And sometimes when you're on a long detour, whether it be of your own recognizance or whether you saw the sign and you needed to turn off or whether you just did it because you thought that's what you needed to do because your phone was telling you uh, that they was construction ahead and you need to go around this way and your phone took you about two hours off course and you thought you was going to run out of gas. Has anybody ever been in life uh, and trying to get around in a detour, uh, in a delay, uh, and thought you was going to make better time to go this way uh, and all of a sudden you realize uh, that they wasn't even nothing up ahead. Uh, you could have kept going straight, uh, but you took it upon yourself uh, to take a detour go two hours around uh, and almost uh, run out of gas some back roads in Texas I'm telling you they some God forsaken places in Texas you hear me 
You ain't never seen such God-forsaken place. Ain't nothing but oil fields. This is what they're doing like this all the way, all the way. <laughs> you learn how to trust God. You'll learn how to quote Romans 8, 28, amen? You'll learn how to quote a lot more scripture. You'll learn how to pray. This means there ain't nothing to teach you how to pray when you need God, amen? And God will put you in place sometimes where you need God. And through the delay and, through the, and even going and coming back, there was all kind of work zones, work zones. Louisiana and Texas was eat up with, with construction on the highway. And some of those work zones, you come to the sign, uh, and, and that work zone, it wouldn't be a mile long. And you come to other work zones, it'd be 20, 30, 40 miles long. And, and, and traffic, and delays, and, and crap, it just come to a creep. And then all of a sudden, it just stop. And you're sitting on this 10-mile bridge, 10-mile mile bridge, 10-mile bridge. You're sitting on this bridge. It's 10 o'clock at night. You're sitting on this bridge trying to get through, trying to go. And you, it, it, it's, just, it's stopping. You get impatient. What happens when you get impatient? Oh, my gosh. If they could have heard me, God, thank God there wasn't nobody riding with me but Jesus. And Jesus understands me like nobody else does. Amen. But praise the Lord, I done got impatient. I done got to a place where I was losing it. Now, I was losing it. I wanted to get around, go ahead, get over. Whatever we had to do, uh, just get this thing moving again. Have you ever been in that place where you've just been stuck in life like that? Where you can't seem to get up, where you can't seem to go ahead, uh, where all of a sudden you find yourself uh, in a delay in a construction zone? Uh, God has those work zones uh, in our life. But God is able to work things together. God is able to work it out. After a while, you'll start moving again. After a while, you'll be back in the blue and out the red and you can go on. After a while. But see, sometimes God has to work things together. And the reason it ain't working out is because you ain't the only one in the line. And what you praying to God about, what you asking God for, what you want to see God work in, you ain't the only duck on the pond. Your prayer is touching somebody else's life, and God's got to work in that life. He's got to work in that situation. He has to work over here in this circumstance in order to tie it all together to answer your prayer and bring good out of evil. But he's God, and he'll do it. He'll do it. You remember what he said in Genesis chapter 50? You remember what Joseph said to his brothers? <laughs> because if anybody knew uh, what it was uh, to be done dirty uh, and underhanded uh, and how his brothers had betrayed him and sold him into slavery uh, and how he had been exiled from his father uh, for 20 years uh, and then Jacob and the boys came uh, and, 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 and Joseph was second in charge in Egypt uh, under Pharaoh uh, and Joseph uh, gave them a land to live in. Uh, his daddy died. Uh, the brothers come to Joseph. They're weeping uh, in chapter 50 uh, because they think Joseph had called Jacob his dad. God is going to kill him, kill them. And Joseph said to them in Genesis 50 and 20, you meant it for evil, but God allowed it for good. God allowed it for good. You, as for you, you meant it for evil. He said, I know what you meant. He said, but God has been working together. God has been working it out God ain't just been working it out in your situation. God's been working it out in my heart, in my life, in my spirit, in my mind. God has been working this thing together to the point that I can trust God. I can depend on him. I don't have to look to none other. And I can do what God wants me to do, not what I want to do. Because so many times in life, we find ourselves like Joseph. You meant it for evil. Allowed it for good. And if it had not been for but God. But God. 
If God hadn't got in your mess, it'd still be a mess. If God hadn't got in the midst of it and began to work in it, only God could turn it around. Only God could heal it. Only God could allow you to overcome it. But God, has God ever got in your stuff? Has God ever just walked right up in the middle of your mess? It didn't begin good, but it ended good. Amen. Joseph's story didn't begin good, but it ended good. Job's story didn't begin good, but it ended good. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. Hither, Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord and Job was blessed double in the end for all that he went through for all that he had to suffer for all of his trouble and his trial but God had to work it together he had to work it together when that Bible says for good that means into good into when we, when we say into that means it's going to take a little time. And time is something we don't want to give God. It, it's going to take some time. Sometimes God does things suddenly. Sometimes God does things immediately. And sometimes God takes some time. And it's in those places where God has taken time. I just want to ask you this morning, huh, will you see it to completion? Will you stay in it and stay in the faith until you see God finish the work? Because too many people want to give up on God. I, I'm thankful for Nehemiah. I'm thankful that whenever Nehemiah, uh, well, listen to me, he prayed for four months uh, before he ever uttered a word uh, about God had called uh, him to go back uh, and rebuild the wall uh, of Jerusalem. Pray for four months. And then King Artaxerxes asked him, he said, he said, he said, what's wrong, man? He said, Nehemiah, what's wrong with you? And he told him how his heart was burdened because the wall was torn down and God had called him to go back and fix that wall. He didn't know how it was going to happen. <laughs> Nehemiah went back and the king provided all, everything that he would need. And when he got there, they started working on the wall. And Nehemiah <laughs> came up against opposition, came up against Nehemiah. In Sambala, Geshem, and Tobiah, the enemy come up against him. The adversary, there was opposition. There was those that didn't want the wall built. But you know what Nehemiah did? He seen it to completion. Amen. He stayed on the wall. When they said, come down off that wall and come meet us in the valley of Ono. You know what Nehemiah did? He said, I ain't got time to talk to you. God's called me to this purpose. God called me to this ministry. God's called me to this place. And I got to do the work of the Lord. Listen to me. If you allow the enemy to, he will distract you. He will move your focus with his words, with his lies, with his deception, with his suggested manipulation. But you got to stand on Romans 8, 28 and say, I know that my God is working all things together for good to them who love God and are the called according to his purpose. His purpose. Listen to me. You ever seen your mama and your granny make a cake? Maybe you made a cake. You get everything, you set it out on the, on the bar. They, there's all kind of stuff that goes into a cake. There's flour, there's eggs, oil, baking powder, baking soda, all kind of stuff that goes into a cake. Have you ever just reached in a bag of flour and got you a spoonful and started eating the flour. So this is so good. This is so good. You ever cracked you three eggs in a glass, chugged them, that's all them eggs taste so good. So good. You ever reached in and got you some baking soda and just put it in your mouth, swooshed it around, said, boy, there ain't no better baking soda than that right there. You ever got you a cup of oil and said, man, it's the best tasting oil I ever drank in my life. Man, it's some good oil right here now. No, we don't do that. Mama put it all in a bowl. 
all of it together. And she'd get to take that spoon and work that thing up. And she worked it together. And then she poured it in a pan and stuck it in the oven. And 35 minutes later, she brought it out. And nothing stuck to the toothpick, bless God. And after a while, bless God, she put that thing together, put some icing on it and cut it. And you know what? It was good. Amen. You know why? Because I gave her time to work that thing together. And there's some things in life that you try to get you a spoonful and you get you a swig of and you roll it around in your mouth and it tastes bad. It's nasty. You want to spit it out. You don't want to have nothing to do with it. But if you'll give God some time to work it together for good, on the other side of it, listen to me, don't, don't judge the end by the beginning, okay? Don't judge the end by the way things start. Don't, don't do that. Boy, you'll give up in a minute. Because God is the God of both the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's God. And you've got to give him time to work. Can I give you the title to the message today? I was afraid if I gave it to you at the beginning, you wouldn't understand. The title to the message today is, It's All Good. It's All Good. You say, Preacher, how's it good when you get diagnosed with cancer? It's not good. How's it good when you've been in a tragic accident? It's not good. How's it good when you lose a child in death? It's, it's not good. It's not good. There's so many things in life that are evil and not good. But I'm thankful today that we serve the God who can take wrong and make it right who's able to work evil for good. In a world where we call darkness light, and light darkness, where we call evil good, and good evil. In a place where we just don't seem to know. Friend, I want you to know today that there ain't nothing God can't do. Nothing that God can do. All things work together. A couple months ago, we celebrated what's called Good Friday. It's the day Jesus went to the cross and died in our place. From that night that he was arrested and betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he stood in the mock trial before the Sanhedrin and they judged him and they said that he was condemned to death on a cross between two thieves, unjustly condemned. They took him and tied him to a whipping post and beat him with a cat of nine tails, took the flesh off of him, opened him up where you could see his entrails and his ribs were exposed. And when they brought him to a place that was so near death, they put a beam on his shoulders and led him down to Via Della Rosa where he fell under the weight of that beam. And they pulled a man from the side, Simon the Serene, and put the cross on him and made him bear it up to the hill called Golgotha. And there they took Jesus and laid him on that cross, uh, threw him on the ground, laid him on the cross, uh, nailed him in his hands and his feet, uh, hung him naked between the heavens and the earth. Uh, and there he was mocked uh, and humiliated uh, and shamed uh, and reproached uh, for you uh, and for me. It was there that he became sin for us, uh, and we call it good. We call it Good Friday. 
But if you were to ask the disciples that were there uh, uh, watching from a distance, if you were to ask Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus uh, and those that were around the cross uh, as his followers, uh, they would tell you there was nothing good uh, about that Friday. But when you give God a little time, God's always good to his promise. And Jesus said, as the Son of Man will go into the heart of the earth for three days uh, and three nights, uh, I'll rise again. And three days later, he rose early Sunday morning. He got up out of the grave, uh, and he appeared to the disciples in the upper room, uh, Mary Magdalene uh, at the garden tomb. Uh, and friend, I come to tell you today uh, that they could stand before us uh, and testify uh, about what happened in the past. Uh, and sometimes uh, it just ain't good. But if you'll give God just a little time, if you'll let God work in it, if you'll trust Him through it, then you'll be able to see God take that which was meant for evil and bring about it for good. Everybody will stand to your feet. This verse will help you today. We live in a world of violence and killing, in a world of injustice, in a world of moral decadence, in a world where if Jesus don't come, I don't know what a lot of people's going to do. Because I don't think a lot of people know. And friend, if you find yourself in that group today, and you're not a part of the we you can be because Jesus made a way for you he died on the cross and took your place rose on the third day and if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved Don't stay in a religious place. Know today that you love God and that you are the called according to his purpose.